Thank you very much. Um, firstly, thank you to the Goldman family. It's an absolute honour, and I'm very humbled, and the business school as well. So without further ado, I'm absolutely passionate about medical technology. I live and die medical technology, and my entire career has been in life science and technology. So I thought the best thing to do is to spend 40 minutes talking about some of the innovations I've been involved in, which you'll be experiencing now in, in your lives, um, that started off as startup companies many, many years ago. I started my career just over the water at Sunderland. I did a, a degree in pharmacy, and that started a, a career for me in the pharmaceutical industry. I'd never really heard about the pharmaceutical industry. I thought I was going to be a retail pharmacist or work in a hospital, but Sunderland really sort of inspired me. And by more by luck than design, I ended up working for three of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. And that gave me a great training. I learned everything, sales, marketing, research, regulatory, clinical trials, government, and a little bit of finance along the way. I then did a, an MBA at the University of Warwick. I realized I needed more depth in my business knowledge. I needed to be more strategic, to learn a little bit more about operationals and how we make money work in businesses. And I topped that off with some finance qualifications as well. And that gave me like a triangle of, of experience and qualification. I had science, I had business, and now I had finance. And that gave me the confidence to start doing startups. So I ran startups, um, Cambridge in the UK, in um, Switzerland, in Zurich, in Auckland, in New Zealand, and in the US as well. And along the way, uh, I started to be asked if I would mentor startup companies in the UK and help them get started, help them raise a bit of money, maybe write their strategy, maybe write their business plan. And it's been a really successful and innovative time for me. And then moving to the present day, um, as Sav has said, I'm the CEO of a medical software technology company based in Hull. It's virtual reality, and I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. And I'm executive chair of Atelerix, just around the corner from here at the, um, at the Helix. So it's quite a broad mix, and I sit on a number of tech boards as well. So hopefully, I know a little bit about innovation, enterprise, and, and building companies. Now, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit because we have a real challenge in global healthcare. You, know, you can't switch on the news at the moment without hearing about the challenges. And although it's a global crisis, a lot of what's happening globally is also affecting us nationally as well. Now, everybody knows we've got an aging population, which on the one hand is great, we all live longer, but it also means that we get a lot more chronic diseases um, and we have those diseases for longer. There's more cancer, there's more diabetes, there's more Alzheimer's, you name it, and it all costs a lot of money. Coupled with that, we all got a bit of a, a wake-up call um, during COVID. And, you know, we can criticise the government to death, but having an international career and talking to my colleagues across the world, everybody was surprised at our vulnerabilities of our healthcare systems. We didn't have enough equipment. We didn't have enough ventilators, enough respiratory machines. We didn't have enough PPE, or we found out that uh, our stock in the warehouses had gone out of date. And we also had a shortages of the particular medical staff that would be um, able to help during the pandemic. So it was a real wake-up call for the whole world. Um, that coupled with what we're seeing now is increased waiting times for patients in hospitals. Thirdly, we have a lifestyle-related problem. So although we're more health conscious, we're actually more obese. We get more diabetes because of the lifestyles that we, um, we have. An interesting fact I, I picked up over the weekend in one of the Sunday supplements. In 1951, only 1% 1 of the UK was obese. If you fast forward today, it's 21% of us are obese. And that's our problem, and we, we've done that to ourselves as well, eating too much sugar, too much carbohydrate, too much fat. So we have lifestyle-related diseases, which we've got to try and tackle as well. And then coupled on that, we've got staffing shortages, nurses, doctors, pharmacists, radiotherapists, doctors, etc. And what is interesting to me as a um, you know, CEO of companies is that I'm seeing healthcare 
is not a profession that people are as attracted to as, say, 10, 15 years ago. The careers that they want now are, are computer scientists, data analysts, a blogger, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got to think, how can we get people back into healthcare and make it attractive again? And we also know that people are worn out after the pandemic and they're leaving the healthcare system. So not only have we got shortages in this country, there are shortages across the world as well. That will be our problem because one day we'll end up in hospital and we'll need treatment and it's going to be a real, real problem. It's multifaceted. I don't think there's one answer to how we solve the global healthcare crisis. But innovation is going some way towards solving inefficiency, making us more effective, getting better patient outcomes. And that's something that I want to concentrate on. I thought about my career, and it um, spans about 35 years. And as again, more, sometimes more by chance than design, I've led or been part of teams that have actually been working on some of the most innovative things that the world has, has ever seen. And I've picked out just five big areas. Um, robotics, wearable health technology, AI, ML, virtual reality, and the last one, um, the transporting of cells. A great company in the northeast, based in Newcastle, round the corner, that really piqued my interest a couple of years ago. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what they're doing, because they're right up there in terms of innovation. So, going back about almost 10 years ago, I was asked if I would lead a robotics company. I knew nothing about engineering, knew nothing about um, robotics at all. And the chairman of the company and the VC um, knew me. I'd run a company for him before, which had been successful. And he persuaded me to go into this company. It was the most fantastic career change for me. An exoskeleton, as, as it probably the name suggests, is a, a, a frame, a skeleton worn outside the body. And it was designed by two Scottish engineers to enable people who had mainly spinal cord injuries. It enabled them to stand up to move, to walk, but also to exercise. And my task was to, to raise some money. We needed about 10 million, and we raised 10.3, and to commercialize this product um, across the world. Just by chance, when I was pulling out some photographs, I realized that we beta tested the product in Middlesbrough at the James Cook Hospital, just, just you know, down the road, basically. And it was in the spinal cord injury unit, they allowed some of their patients to trial the exoskeleton for us, and we started to build up an idea of how it was going to work. So initially we thought we might sell this to individuals who've had a spinal cord injury, want to stand up and move around. That thinking changed over time, and we started to market the product for, for exercise. So it was designed for paraplegic patients initially. So that's when you've got two, two limbs um, that don't work. So it was for lower limb um, disability. And it was controlled by a joystick, which you can just about see on the right-hand side. That worked really well. We started to talk to physiotherapy companies. They liked the idea. If you imagine somebody who's been paralyzed, how heavy they are. And it takes two or three physiotherapists to be able to help that person move their limbs, move them forward, move them sidewards. If you imagine sitting in a wheelchair 12 hours a day, just sitting you know, on, a, on a table, let's to a table 12 hours a day, the first thing you want to do is stand up and stretch. And if you sit in a chair for long enough, the muscle between your knees and your thigh gets shorter and you need to stretch that out. And what the physiotherapists were doing was getting the exoskeleton to walk backwards so that you stretch that muscle. And we soon realized that it would be a very useful tool for physiotherapy. Then we were approached a little bit later on by um, a university in Rome. And they said to us, do you think you'd be able to control your exoskeleton through thought control? And we said, well, we don't know. Well, let's work with you. And our research team and their research team got together. We flew over to Rome. Um, the guy on the right is, is Rob Cam, and he had a spinal cord injury when he was at school. He was playing rugby Wednesday afternoon, school fixture, collided with somebody and had a, uh, an injury and he's paralyzed from the neck down. He's tetraplegic. 
which means not only can he not use his, his legs, his feet, he can't use his arms, his hands, but also he can't use his lungs either. And he was really keen to try it. So our teams got together. You can see he's wearing a skull cap, um, which has got a lot of electrodes um, across the gap and with gel. And we got Rob to think about walking. And his um, brain signals went through his skull into the electrodes and we fed that into a computer. The computer decoded it and passed those messages to the actuators <coughs> in the legs of the, of the machine. We didn't know whether it would work. We all gathered, this is in just in a, a gymnasium in a university in Rome, and it was a mixture of professors, lecturers, researchers, and we all sat and waited, and we waited. First of all, it didn't work, and then we said to Rob, don't think about anything else, because his brain signals were going all over the place. Just think about walking. And that's why he's got his eyes closed. And he said he imagined himself waiting at the side of the road, waiting for the green man to come on. And when the green man uh, came on, changed from red to green, he started walking in his mind. And then all of a sudden, we heard the machine start, and he started walking, and it was absolutely amazing. And I, I took that um, photograph just on my phone, basically, and I quickly changed from a photograph to a video and posted it on social media, and it went viral. It was picked up by all the newspapers in this country. That was the Daily Mirror who picked that one up. And it was picked up by television stations across the world. And we realised that thought control can move a robot. So it's still being used, um, or exoskeletons are still being used for physiotherapy. They're a lot lighter now. That was very heavy. It was about six stone. Um, they're a little bit quicker. That only went at one mile per hour. But it was the start of something which, at the time, there were only six companies doing this, and now there are hundreds of exoskeletons. The second innovation is wearable technology. This is probably one that you're more familiar with. And wearable technology, the market for that is growing and growing and growing. One of the biggest drivers are consumers. We can't get enough of wearable technology. And there are three big trends. Um, it's everything really from electronic socks to <coughs> smart clothes. But the thing I think most people are familiar with are the watches, the Apple watches, um, and maybe some monitors, blood pressure monitors, glucose monitors, that sort of thing. But the three trends are it's absolutely revolutionising patient health, patient monitoring, and fitness. There's probably nobody in the room who during lockdown didn't find an app on their phone and started to try and measure how many steps they'd done. And it was interesting, most of us couldn't get anywhere near 10,000 without really putting a lot of effort in. And we realised how sedentary we are, you know, sometimes only 2,000 a day without putting that, that extra effort in. The trend is continuing, the technology has got better and better, and not only now can you measure your steps, you can measure your heart rate, you can measure your respiratory rate, lots and lots of things. And people are becoming more health conscious. I mean, I've noticed that in my career, that people want to take control of their health as opposed to doctor says you should do this. And this is one of the ways we can actually look at our bodies, look at what's happening in our bodies and take that control. And then finally, remote monitoring. It's a sort of three-pronged um, you know, triangle. It's the patient knows what's happening because of the wearable technology telling that patient what's happening. But also the doctor knows what's happening as well, or the clinical team, where those um, messages can be downloaded and sent to the clinical team so you can monitor patients a lot more. And that trend is, is continuing. And there's everything now from cardiac monitoring, sleep monitoring, fetal monitoring, weight monitoring, you name it, there's a monitor. And it's a really simple but effective way of measuring that patient's symptoms, but also giving you a 24-hour look at what's happening to that patient, as opposed to a snapshot in time where you go to the doctors, have your blood pressure, go home again. And the trend is, is, is getting higher, more and more people are being monitored at home. But recently, you might have noticed there's a lot more things in the newspapers and papers being written. Are we missing underlying conditions? So if you're being monitored for your, um, your blood pressure, and your blood pressure is fine, is it stopping you going to your doctor where the doctor says, how's things going? What's, you know, what's happening? You might not mention that you've had a bowel problem, which might be the first sign of prostate cancer or bowel cancer. 
And it's those things which now the healthcare profession is thinking, are we missing those things? Because we're not talking to people as much face to face, are we missing the, the vital signs? So I think we've got to be a little bit careful there. Third innovation, AI and ML. I'm passionate about this. Literally, there are so many different things that you can do with artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's completely revolutionizing everything within the healthcare setting from booking the patient in through to diagnosis, monitoring, treatment plans, etc. And there are so many different ways we can use AI. I've just picked out three, which are sort of like the big groups that they fall into. So the first one, medical diagnosis. If you have got something wrong inside your body, you generally have a scan. So, um, you know, it can be a scan of your heart, your liver, whatever. Or if you have a mammogram, um, you know, if women um, go for regular mammograms, then your images are sent back to the hospital. AI and algorithms can read those mammograms 30 times quicker than a human can. So they can get through the workload a lot, lot quicker. And the 99% accurate is actually higher than a human accuracy. So the reading is quicker and the accuracy is higher. On the drug discovery side, I remember the days when we were testing drug molecules almost manually. Does this drug molecule work on this particular cell line? No. Does this drug work on this particular cell line? No. And you did it over and over and over again. What um, AI and, and, and machine learning, but mainly AI can do, is accelerate that drug discovery process. You can find those drug molecules that are actually having an effect on your cell lines a lot quicker and speed up that first part of the drug discovery process. The downside is clinical trials now also take longer. So although we're speeding up the front end, once the drug goes into humans, the trials are taking longer, there are more things that you need to do in a clinical trial setting. So we haven't actually shortened the process, but we have speeded up the front end. And pharmaceutical companies can be a lot more confident that the drug molecule that they've selected is actually the one that is going to make a difference. And then finally, in medical research, because all this data is being collated either in the hospital or at a regional level or on a country level, Microsoft have got most of our data, Apple has got a lot of our data as well, can we start to see patterns emerging where we can start to prevent diseases before they happen? There's massive data sets that are being analysed, but again, we've got to be careful. So patients are getting better outcomes, but... If you know anything about how you get a drug on the market or a medical device on the market, it has to go through, a lot of them have to go through a regulatory process. So in this country, we call it MHRA. In Europe, we call it EMEA. In America, it's the FDA. And the regulators and the guidance hasn't caught up with innovation. Innovation is always ahead of guidance and it always has been my whole career I've seen that but what I'm seeing now is it is so far behind the innovation and it's going to take a while to catch up and the regulators quite rightly I suppose are being cautious and they'd rather say no I don't understand how this is working I don't understand what the risk is and it's taking longer to get products onto the market. So it affects us in the industry. We can't get products onto the market maybe as quickly as we want. But from a patient and safety perspective, you can understand it. And we need to get more people in these regulatory authorities who actually understand the innovation. A virtual reality. Um, I'm CEO of a, of a company in Hull called Virtual. And virtual reality or simulation is being used in all different areas um, across the world in universities, whether you're training medical students, pharmacists, engineers, etc. If you can simulate something, the student can learn how to do that particular task or that particular skill in a very, very safe environment and repeat it over and over again. And if they get it wrong, understand why they got it wrong and what the consequences of getting that wrong. 
Virtuality in radiation therapy is, is something which I've been involved in probably for about the last five years, training students or developing software to train students around the world to be radiation therapists or medical physicists when they, when they graduate. And it's really changed how we train our students. It's opened their eyes to the fact that they can make mistakes, but they can make mistakes safely and not feel ashamed about it and practice over and over again. Radiation therapy is, a, if, in, you know, in case you don't know, is a treatment for cancer. So if you've got cancer cells in your body, you can either take a drug, you can either have surgery, or you can have chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And radiation therapy is highly energised radiation going into your body through your skin and attacking the tumour. And what the radiation does is it um, goes it into the cell, attacks the DNA, stops the cell from dividing, cell dies, and hopefully the tumour shrinks. And it's a very complex field to learn. It takes about three or four years to learn how to be a radiation therapist. And the radiation therapist has to know everything from getting the patient positioned on the couch, calculating the dose of the radiation, the beam length, etc. If you look at the top left, um, this is a colour wash of an image. So the red part is cancer. That's a tumour inside somebody. And as you go further out to the skin, out to the outside, the blue part, that's the skin. So if you're a radiation therapist and you're trying to work out how to kill that tumour, you've got to work out the dose of that radiation. You've also got to work out how far the patient and the beam needs to be from each other. And if you've ever been for um, radiation therapy or been for a scan, you'll have seen these great big machines called Linux and the Linux deliver the radiation. And a lot of the more modern Linux now spin. So they put a dose of radiation into you all the way. They go under the couch and back around again. And tumours are very rarely spherical. So as the beam of radiation moves around, it's got to change slightly to be able to hit that tumour. Because what you don't want to do is hit the surrounding tissue if you're trying to attack somebody's prostate, you don't want to kill the cells in their bladder and dif dysfunction their bladder. So it's a very precise field. And obviously they can't practice on patients with real radiation. So they can practice in a simulated setting, get the dose right, get the positioning right. And it also helps them talk to the patients as well to emphasize the importance of that patient's got to keep pretty damn still while they're having their radiation therapy, and it could take seven, eight, nine minutes, and that's a long time to keep very, very still. So it's helping them understand not only the anatomy, but also how to be better radiation therapists. So VR really is like a flight simulator for Linux, these great big machines, in the same way that an airline pilot would, ever, would never fly a flight without practicing over and over again before they actually take the aircraft up into the air. And VR enables all students to be able to practice what they're going to do when they qualify in a, in a safe environment. So it's just like the real thing. And more recently, we've realized, talking to universities around the world, that the students want to practice at home as well. They don't want to just do it in the, in the lecture theater in the university. So we've created, it's not 3D, it's 2D simulation for them. And working with um, universities across the world and their curricula, we've matched which parts of the curricula, which modules can you simulate, which parts of the modules can't you simulate. And we've given that to students as well. So and it's particularly... Um, useful at exam time, they can practice and practice and practice and get it right. And now um, there are 35 countries using VERT simulation software across the world and 41% of universities and teaching institutions who teach radiation therapy at either master's level or degree level now use VERT software. So it started as a spin out from Hull University and now it's one of the most, um, which is the leading um, vert supplier in the world. And finally, Atelerix. 
Telerix, as, as Sava said, is a company that's been out of University of Newcastle and around the corner. And I first saw this company probably about a year and a half ago. I was approached about um, whether I'd be interested in having a look at this company. And two of the founders are in the audience today. So Professor Che Connan and Dr. Steve Swicklow are the inventors. They're the brains behind it. All I do is turn companies into hopefully successful multi-million pound companies. They are absolutely paramount. Inventors need a lot of support and they need a lot of um, funding to get their companies off the ground. And my role is to bring that funding in, work out the strategic plan and get this company um, being very, very successful. But what Atelerix have done, and the reason why I was really interested in this is... What they've done is they've worked out how to preserve cells and tissues and viruses and preserve them without freezing them. And you're probably thinking, why is that important? It's absolutely massively important. It's a real game changer. All my career, I've seen researchers struggle with live tissue, with biological tissue. Once it comes out of your body, it starts to degrade. You know, if you leave meat out of the fridge, it wouldn't really last more than a day. As soon as you take cells out of the human, you know, the blood product, it starts to deteriorate. And the only real way you can actually um, preserve it is to freeze it. This negates freezing. It's absolute game changing. So they've solved a multi-million pound problem. I'm trying to change that to multi-billion. Um, it will be really good if we get the first unicorn um, out of Newcastle University. When cells are frozen, some of them die. So it's not great for a lot of cells. The ones that don't die, they're not as viable. They don't do what they did before you froze them. So you freeze them and then you thaw them and they don't do the same thing anymore. It's a real problem. If you think about drug discovery, as we were talking about before, everything that's probably in your medicine cabinet now, 15, 20 years ago, was a drug molecule being tested on a cell somewhere in a lab somewhere around the world. And that cell was then tested, um, you know, it, it progressed, it went into animals, it went into humans, it went into clinical trials, it got regulated, and then it came onto the market. But right at the very beginning, of thousands and thousands of researchers working on cells. And these are live tissues, as I said. They need a better way of preserving those cells because otherwise they've got to work on them immediately or they've got to freeze them. And once they freeze them, some of them die. So it's not great. So when I saw this, um, I just thought, wow, this is amazing. I want to be part of this. A little bit about how it works, and apologies to Che and Steve, who could probably explain this a lot better than I do, but our cells in our body work best at 37 degrees. When you freeze them, there's various chemical reactions that happen, and sometimes the cell membrane splits and breaks. They're, they're quite fragile, so they die, or they're not as viable. What a Telerix does is it stabilises the cell membrane. A Telerix of uh, developed and patented a alginate hydrogel that encapsulates the cells and it keeps them in like an inert state, a quiescent state, for up to two weeks at ambient temperature. That's absolutely phenomenal. If you're a research scientist, you, you're going to be blown away by that. What that means is researchers, pharmaceutical companies around the world will be able to store and preserve their live tissue without having to freeze it. And they'll be able to ship it from country to country, from the US to Asia to Europe, etc., without freezing. So it's massive, absolutely massive. And in the future, at the moment, most of our therapy is, is drugs, it's surgery, etc., etc. But say if you've got cancer and you've exhausted the drugs, it can't be surgically removed. Perhaps it's in your brain, it's too dangerous to remove it. There are certain therapies now called cell therapies where that patient, so that cancer patient, their own cells are taken outside their body. The genetic material within that cell is, is changed in some way and then those same cells are put back into that person who's got that disease and it's called cell therapy. Now if you imagine what I've said, you can't really freeze the cells or it's not convenient to freeze the cells. 
if you could use a Telerix technology, that is going to massively change how these companies do their research and how they develop their cell therapy. And we're working with, well, we've spoken to every pharmaceutical company we can think of, and a lot of them are getting very excited about this. So watch this space. In a year's time, I'd like to stand here and say, yeah, we did it. So this is the big one. If you think research um, and cell therapy at the beginning is interesting, once you start going into cell therapies in the future, the market gets even bigger. So finally, I hope I've given you enough insight and you're innovated and you're inspired. Innovation, medical technology and innovation has really changed how we deliver healthcare. Patients are getting better outcomes and we're also taking more control of our own care. But we need funding. UK companies do not get as much funding as the US. If I transplanted every company I'd started in the US, we'd have had money flowing in easily. And the North doesn't get as much funding as the South. I've realized this. Um, I've, I've just moved up to, to North Yorkshire, my husband and I, um, from Oxford. I hadn't realized how much easier it is to raise money in Oxford, Cambridge and London compared to raising money in Newcastle. That's been a real eye-opener for me. So we need to change that. We need to keep lobbying the policymakers to keep funding R&D, to keep funding tech, but also get some money up from the south um, because what we are developing in the north is just as good as what's been, developing, been developed in the south, and we need to change that mindset. So if I've inspired you at all, please get in touch. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to answer any of your questions, but do contact me if you want to do it privately. And over to Sabas. Thank you. As a computer scientist, uh, I'm curious because that underpinned a lot of what you were talking about. Mm. So, how is the sort of pathway between computer science, medical technology, and business? Oh, it's is so it interlinked. Enough, or is it like an area that needs working on? It needs working on. Um, half uh, at virtual, um, half my staff are computer scientists um, because if they can't write the code, the marketing and sales team can't sell it, etc. So it's crucial. I think sometimes there's a misunderstanding if you are a computer scientist that um, going into a career in, in healthcare, in med tech, isn't where you want to go. But programming, coding, is coding, basically. And it's underpinning a lot of the technology in the hospitals now. Um, it, it is, I've, I've seen salaries rise for the computer scientists. They are in demand. We've got a shortage, though, a massive shortage. So I think it's completely interlinked. And we're going to see a lot more computer scientists working cross-functionally with, with the sales teams, with the marketing teams, so that they can develop what the customer says they want in the future. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, yeah. Hi, <coughs> thanks so much for the lecture. Uh, you said towards the beginning of the talk that, uh, that, that your industry is struggling to attract talent, uh, which I found to be odd just because it seems like, don't, you don't seem to be lacking for funds uh, other than what you just said at the very end there. Um, so what, why do you think, what's driving that? Do you mean the healthcare industry, like nurses and, yeah, versus and doctors? Other, versus other sectors, I think you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, you know, it, it's difficult, industry. isn't it? I mean, we've seen the same in the police force, and we've seen the same in the military as well. They're struggling to get new recruits in. I think we need to make it more exciting. If you think about healthcare at the moment, a lot of healthcare involves tech, you know, machines, etc. And I think we need to make it a little bit more interesting, more exciting as a career option. It's very rewarding. I think once you go into medicine, you do find it very, very rewarding. But it's, it's at the school stage, isn't it? I mean, we do lots of talks, um, talking to children around about sort of 16, 17, to encourage them to do either a career in computer science, a career in healthcare, in physiotherapy, in radiotherapy, and showing them the sorts of jobs that they can do. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably an example. As I said, I went to Sunderland and wanted to own a pharmacy shop. That was the, the pinnacle of what I wanted to do. And then I was mixing with people who come from a different background to me, who understood pharmaceutical industry. My lecturers were fantastic at Sunderland. And they said, actually, you know, we think you'll be good in the industry. So maybe, I, I don't know how we do it for, for children and um, students, but maybe open their eyes more to the different types of career that they can have. And you can change career. Um, you know, things are changing. You can start off in one sector and, and move across to another sector if you've got transferable skills. Brian Walker, I'm a physician by background, and so I'm curious about your remarks on regulation. And you've also worked in the pharma sector, which at one extreme is extremely risk averse and slow yeah. to change. And the med tech sector, which some people think is under regulated and just because we can do stuff, we shouldn't necessarily do it. And I wonder, if you, if you did get the regulators populated by experts in med tech, what would you expect them to do to constrain that sector or to make sure that... Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Historically, there were very separate departments. So you either um, went through one route to regulate your, your drug or you went through another route for putting your medical device on the market. And a lot of products and services now Cross the, cross the divide, if you like. So we need to ensure that, uh, and we've, we've you know, not, not in my current role, but I've lobbied governments, etc., to ensure that they try and populate the regulatory authorities with people who understand, say, software, or what that hardware, that, what that bit of medical device does. Now, not all medical devices need... Um, need license, you know, don't go through that route. But there's more of a crossover now. You could have um, some products which are part service, part hardware, part software, and you've got to have somebody who can un actually understand the impact that that kit will have, but also understand the risks as well. And I don't know how we solve it. I, I've seen it all throughout my career, but it seems to be getting worse. And if you've got a regulator who basically says, yes, you can put it on the market, or no, you can't put it on the market, if they don't understand what it is you're doing, they're more likely to say no or come back when you know, you've got more information. So sometimes it takes a long time, which is frustrating, because if you're trying to get it on the market through what was in EMEA, but now MHRA is separated out, and then you see the FDA license a potential competitor product quicker, and you think, great, we invented it. We were three years ahead, and now we're three years behind. So if I understood correctly, you said that using AI machine learning speeds up the choice of the compound to, on the cell, but that somehow caused the slowing down of the actual human trial. But why would that necessarily it didn't, be? It wasn't a causal and effect. Oh. Tri clinical trials now are taking longer. It's taking longer to recruit, um, and the... Oh. Things that you have to show in that trial, um, they just add more and more things, more and more as you go along. So the clinical trials are taking longer, and sometimes you now need more patients to show the outcome. So on one hand, we've speeded it up. Oh, we've got the drug molecule, but... Overall observation as opposed to yeah. the effect. Yeah, right. yeah. Thanks. All right, thank you so much So how do we make sure that the marketing before and after the innovation um, addresses the right um, demographics? So for, for example, before this comes out, someone needs to see it, to approve of it, so that at the policy level, we can get the right um, processes to get them to the people. And once we pass that stage, then marketing goes into the market where we want to talk to the public. How do you see these working? Well, all through your development, you're talking to your potential customers because the last thing you want to do is have an invention, put it on the market and nobody wants it, or you're trying to target it to the wrong group of people. So what you need to do right from the early stage is keep saying, have we got this right? Have we got this right? What needs to change? 
and, and it's a sense, it is a marketing, it's an advocacy. And then you'll get somebody who gets really passionate about what you're doing and you work with them, and they can be then your commercial, your, your marketing champion when you do get it on the market. But woe betide the company who develops something and never asked a customer whether it's right. Um, it, sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. And, and, and you do tweet things like the exoskeletons. They were originally, the, the thought process um, from, the, from, the, from the two engineers was it would be something that you'd move around in, you'd use it in the house and maybe do a bit of exercise and it's completely flipped. It's an exercise machine basically. So physiotherapists can do, you know, if you're trying to lift somebody's leg 20 times while holding them up, it's tiring. Or an exoskeleton will just keep doing it until you tell it to stop. So it's, it's talking to customers, talking to physiotherapists, and they say, that's my main problem. Yeah. <laughs> I think I definitely need that kind of <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, thank you for a really uh, interesting talk. I'm um, particularly interested in student enterprise. So if we were to focus on our, on our amazing students, so what is a, an academic institution fundamentally, um, and uh, many of them are potentially extraordinary entrepreneurs and, and are likely to bring knowledge um, to bear in terms of, of innovations for the future. I wonder if you've got observations about how students whose <coughs> depth of knowledge in their primary discipline can be helped to understand um, that kind of um, intersection with other disciplinary specialisms and the supporting um, kind of functions and, and areas of knowledge mm. that really could propel them towards being um, entrepreneurs in yeah. the future. I mean, it, it, it's asking a lot of questions because everybody's a specialist in something. I'm not the, usually the inventor, but I'm good at business and, 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 and building companies. And it's building that network. So often I work with founders, um, you know, startups around the country who might be an engineer but they've never had any exposure to finance, to business, to commercialization. And often they're very passionate about their product. They've worked on it for about seven or eight years and it's the best thing since sliced bread. But you've got to try and help them say, well, okay, you now need to surround yourself with people who know about marketing, who know about getting products on the market, who know about customer relationship. And nobody is generally an expert at everything. And yeah, we've got entrepreneurs, and I, I, I meet them, and they're probably about 40 years younger than me, and you think, wow, I wish I could have done that at, at 20. But also, there's that naivety as well, that they're going to be the next unicorn without really thinking about, well, how am I going to fund this? How am I going to pay staff? How am I going to do marketing? And it's, it's, it's learning early on that nobody is a one-man band, and you've got to go out to the sectors or the people who understand that bit better than you. I'm not a regulatory expert, but I know enough regulatory experts to be able to help me when I'm stuck on something. So I think that the best advice to, to students that, that I mentor is don't be afraid to ask, and you don't know everything. You might think you do, but you don't. Keep asking and, and get advice from people who've done it. And, and we've all done it, and we've all made mistakes as well, and hopefully we know from those mistakes, not, not how to do that same thing again. Does that answer, answer your question? Yes, well, I'll yeah. be coming back to talk to you about it. As right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you mentioned uh, virtuality uh, and its role in, in training medical, medical staff. Do you, do you see it expanding out of the training field towards any other area of the healthcare? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Anything that you do practically can be simulated. So you, you just got to break it down. So in, in, in my company, we work with the manufacturers of the Linux. And they don't mind working with us. We're not in competition with them. We're training their customers how to use their products in effect. Um, so the, the, the whole virtual reality thing has just ballooned. And, and COVID accelerated it as well, because all of a sudden we're having to try and teach our students remotely. But it was going to happen anyway. I think we've just accelerated the curve. But it's been used in um, engineers are now learning how to do um, various um, engineering tasks using virtual reality. There's no end to it, basically. 
anything that you do can be simulated. And the more we use simulation, the more our students, and it's not just students, uh, the software is also used in hospital when you've got a new person on the team. So they might have learned how to use, I'm going to use the Linux example, a Linux called uh, an Elector. But now they've got a Linux called a Varian. Different manufacturer, slightly different. And they have to learn how to use the new machine. Again, they can't put a patient in and practice putting the dose here, there, and everywhere. So they'll practice using the software until they get very comfortable with it. But I know um, we've been approached by, um, the, the company's based in Hull, and we've been approached by um, Croda, and, and they want to maybe use our software to train their engineers to do various tasks as well. Okay. I'm just wondering about competition for funding, changing that narrative for the North East, so that you have VCs, private equity firms in London, not looking to the Golden Triangle, but looking to us, particularly in life sciences. Mm. How do we change that for the region? Yeah. And secondly, how do we change that for the region's women? Because you've got UK funding, it's one pence in every pound for yeah. female founded businesses. The Rose Review. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. How do we change that? It's going to be difficult because if the VC, the VCs will have certain pots of money during the year. And if a VC can offload that pot of money, because there are enough startups coming out of Oxford University, Cambridge University, they don't need to look anywhere else. What we need to do is, is somehow, and I think it's going to be uh, maybe at a national level, try to get them excited about Newcastle University, Sunderland University, Northumbria University, because we know that the innovation and the startup companies are just as good, but it's, they don't need to go as far as the North, and that's the real shame. Um, I don't know, I mean, I've, I've, I've been racking my brains how to solve it. I've, I've picked up the phone quite a lot for, for a Telerix, and um, the, the VCs know me, and they said, oh, where are you working now? Cambridge, Oxford, London, Newcastle. <laughs> oh, um, we, we will have a look at it, and I can get through the door because people know me, and it's like, oh, it's interesting, but it's a long way away, isn't it? And, and you just think, oh, my goodness. <laughs> So it's, I'm, I'm chipping away at it, I'm chipping away at it. And, and regional funds are just as they, they say, they're regional funds. So Cambridge has regional funds, Oxford has regional funds. They can't go out of their, their area. So we need a lot more nationals, but we also need a lot more VCs coming up to the north. There, there are a couple. Um, Maven have just come up to, I well, know it's not quite Newcastle, Liverpool, um, <laughs> northwest, get, getting higher, getting higher. Um, but we need to attract. Attracts more, yeah. Thank you so much. Such an interesting and thought provocative talk. Um, I was really interested in what you said at the start about how we've never been more health conscious, but also we've never been less healthy. Mm. And that I, was, <laughs> I was really intrigued as to whether or not medical advances almost allow us to be more unhealthy as medicine advances. Mm. The downside of being unhealthy in the ways that you explained maybe is minimized somewhat and it feels almost a sort of consumption way out of overconsumption. and I didn't know if you had an opinion on sort of where the responsibility lies almost is it a public responsibility is it private companies or is it individuals mm. um, sorry if that's a bit mean to you. no I mean it's, it's a really good question because um, last month you might have picked up there's um, uh, an injection that can reduce your fat by 30%, reduce your weight by, by 30%. And I've had conversations in the office, not, not at a Telerix, where people thinking, well, actually, I might try that. <laughs> and you just think, oh, God, you know, it's, it, it's a really strange way to manage your weight, mm. to keep eating what you want, but to inject yourself every day. So, yes, there will always be new drugs, new, new inventions, etc. I think we're more aware... I think we're on the curve of awareness, and I, I was certainly on the curve of awareness when I realised how little steps I did, but have we actually done much about it yet? <coughs> I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know what the answer is. We are more aware of our bodies and our blood pressure and our cholesterol levels, but we also like a McDonald's, <laughs> so I don't know.
technical advancement, innovation, and entrepreneurship is really exciting to me. There's been a lot of developments in the medical technology field, uh, different tools you can get, but there's also been quite a lot of negative press and stories where some organisations have maybe done things that have been unethical, maybe they've um, you know, uh, lied about their results, and I think it's really damaged uh, customer or consumer's perceptions, and maybe that's part of the regulatory um, issues. What I'm curious about from you is I'm wondering, are you seeing anything from stakeholder groups or pressure groups or um, maybe particular groups that have more worries about Line about results. I mean, that's an interesting one. You, you certainly to get a drug on the market, you, you it, full disclosure, um, every trial, whether it's positive or negative. Back when I first started um, in the industry, you didn't have to publish all your results. So if your um, trial or whatever didn't produce what you wanted to do, that oh okay, it didn't work. I'll try this dose. I'll try a different dose, etc. Now you have to publish everything. So as soon as you do a clinical trial, and it's all online now, so you can actually monitor the trial and you can monitor your competitors' trials and you know what, what's happening, etc. So the, the sort of the drug side, you, you, there's no hiding good, bad, side effects, whatever, it's all public information. Um, we've got Theranos, haven't we, in, in the US, where um, uh, the lady misled the, the venture capitalists about um, her products and, and what it worked, how it works. I've noticed that the due diligence from venture capitalists is deeper. Um, so going back, I don't know, 10 years or whatever, People would trust that they know you, they know you run companies, they know you build them, da, 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 da. But they are now behind them as an investment committee who's saying, can you make sure that, um, say Deb, shows you the financial model, the market research, how big's the market? Um, is there any evidence that customers have already tried it? What did they think about it? So there's a lot more due diligence now than there was. This is in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm not sure you can hide bad results anymore. Um, I think you've just got to be more transparent um, and get the funding in the first place to get a product on the market. I mean, you literally got to show them everything because you can, you know, your shoe size. And I stand between you and the refreshment, so maybe we we'll take two last <laughs> questions. Yeah. From, from the VC perspective, from the funders' perspective. This is sort of two questions there, isn't it? The sort of the politician side and the, the funding side. On the funding side, um, VCs do generally have a life science or a health um, technology arm to them. So you will have specialists in there who've either run businesses in, in that sector or worked in that sector before. So they are, they are knowledgeable about about that, the sector, and they know um, from experience what works, what doesn't work, and they look at things, not only just the product, but they also look at the team, um, the cohesiveness of the team, the founders, are the founders still in the business, are the founders left the business, etc. From the government side, um, that's, that's a tricky one. We, we always seem to have science ministers and R&D czars and, and all that sort of thing. 
One of the things which has disappointed me recently is the R&D tax credits. So on the one hand, they're saying, let's really push innovation, small companies. We want to be the life science sector of the world. Oh, we're going to stop your, your R&D tax credit. And the two, two departments don't seem to be talking to each other. And for small companies, your R&D tax credits, when basically you're doing very little sales, very little marketing, all the money that you're spending is on R&D. You need that tax credit to keep going. And to cut that just seems ludicrous. So I've just... Um, signed one of the letters that you've probably seen round robins can you sign this letter because we're going to petition parliament it's crazy what they've just done yeah hello hello thank you, thank you Deborah, for your uh, talk so i'm kate welsh i work with social enterprises generally across the region so i'm most interested in that whole health inequality question mm. so one of the challenges is the world you're working in is driven by finance, it's driven by the returns that you get. But yeah. how do we make sure that some of this is actually really, or as much of this as possible, yeah. is reaching the people who really need it? Because lots of those health conditions are in our poorest communities, they're with people who aren't engaging with health services necessarily, they don't have wearable technology, they can't afford it. Yeah. So how do we bring those two bits together? Because we're seeing mm. great innovation in the social enterprise world about engagement, about bringing dental practices into schools so that you can see all sorts of things like that but mm. I don't see the two worlds they're not just not together. connecting so how no. do we bring those two worlds together because <laughs> that's one of the that's, biggest that's, that's probably a, a lecture and a half isn't it how we, how we bring them together <laughs> it's uh, we, we, we know that there are certain parts of our population who either don't want to go to the doctors or can't go to the doctors or even just the bus for getting to the hospital or the surgery is too much I think it starts, some of it is education, and I think we need to get more public announcements out there about how help is available for people who have certain conditions. I think we have to make the services more accessible, but I don't know how, how to make them more accessible. And it, it is, it, I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to that one. It, it's hard. I've seen campaigns throughout my career um, about getting people to go and um, I, I was in, involved with Viagra in the early days and trying to get um, men to go to the doctors was nigh impossible and we realised that actually let's target their wives, their partners etc because they know what's happening get them to talk to their husbands or their partners and get them to the doctor and that was a campaign which we, we developed over time and getting your cholesterol checked. I was, um, God, it says how old I am, worked on Zocor Simvastatin, um, developing it, and then I was a very, very junior marketer, launched um, Simvastatin in, into this country. And at the time, nobody even knew what cholesterol was, never mind the cholesterol level. So we had to start campaigns so that patients would go to their doctor and asked to have their cholesterol taken. And now it's routine. You know, if you have a three-year annual check at the doctor's, um, they'll take some blood and it'll be sent away and it'll tell you everything that's in that blood sample. But often it takes the industry to do something as opposed to the government doing something. And the community. Yeah. Something yeah. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Deborah, first of all, for your uh, very insightful lecture. Uh, I think there's a lot of food for thought about things that we can explore over the next year. And so thank you very much for answering all the questions. I'm sure there are more questions. Uh, and we can continue the discussion downstairs at the last line. So thank you very much for attending.